praise God. So we're just going to open up a word of prayer real quick, and then we'll jump into today's lesson. Father God, we come to you the mighty name of your dear Son, Lord Jesus. I just uh, uh, decree my, um, my necessity just to lean on you, to trust in you for the lesson this morning, Father God, as, as always that uh, your spirit and your voice gets heard above and beyond my words, Father God, and uh, my lesson plan and what I intended to teach, Father God. And I thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit has freedom to teach. I thank you, Father God, that your spirit teaches above and beyond, Father God, to the spirits uh, of the hearts and the souls of uh, uh, the people that are listening, not just here in the class, but will be watching on the Internet later on. Lord, I just thank you for your anointing. I thank you for your uh, liberty just to set the captives free. I thank you for your word just uh, enriching and fulfilling our lives, Father God. That, Father God, we come to understand the mystery that you have revealed in, in this lesson, Father God. And we just thank you, Father God, just that uh, we have more of you. And I thank you that the revelation that you want to teach us today just comes uh, across loud and clear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Okay, uh, we're going to recap uh, just a little bit. Um, we didn't get too much through our lesson plan uh, last week, so we're going to quickly go through and try to get on to today's as well. So um, starting off, we don't have the, the verses up there. Don't worry about it. Um, we're just going to go ahead and jump in uh, with Ephesians 2, 22. It says, In whom you were builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. We talked about last week how uh, we have a part to play, how we're literally... Uh, bricks and the foundation that God is actually building, how Jesus was the chief cornerstone uh, of the plan of God, and how we're uh, called to be just right along the alignment, right alongside of Him, and so that this building, this, this uh, work that God has actually purposed and it's actually uh, uh, called us to be part of, we're like bricks in a, in a building that's going to be a strong foundation, it's going to be a mighty tower, the world's going to see it, and there's a reason that He's building all this together. and. Um, that in this verse it also says that uh, we'll, we're being, being builded together, we're being brought together, not just in a local church sense, but also in a, in a larger sense for the body of Christ worldwide, that God has a purpose in building this uh, whole system together. And that we're built together and there's a habitation uh, that God has built and it's through the Spirit. This habitation that God has built, Jesus talked about how he would, uh, the temple would be destroyed and three days later it would be built up again. And he talks about how we are now the dwelling place for the Holy Spirit, our own selves, our own lives, our, our inner man is the place where God is actually dwelling today. And so uh, the Amplified says, In Him and in fellowship with one another, you yourselves are being built up into this structure with the rest to form a fixed abode, a dwelling place of God in and by the Spirit. So uh, just to recap, that's the end of uh, chapter 2. Uh, Ephesians 3 is what we're about to launch into, but just real quick, um, we've looked at so far a lot of uh, Ephesians talking about the Holy Spirit, how uh, in chapter 1, God made the plan of redemption. In chapter 2, um, Jesus executed the plans, and in chapter 3, we're about to find out how the Holy Spirit reveals the plan to all mankind. So this is the part where we are today. We're, we're in what's called the church age. We're in uh, what's called the, the age of grace, where God has actually given us a span of time to grow, to multiply, to be fruitful and multiply, to grow the church and bring other uh, family members, our loved ones, our, our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers uh, into the same body, bring them into the family, and actually spread this gospel beyond just the four walls of a building. So, remember I just said... God is building this habitation. We are now the habitation. When we go, God is with us. He's dwelling. And it's literally like we're taking the, the Holy of Holies, the tabernacle that was in the Old Testament. We're taking it with us. The presence of God is always with us. And so in any given situation, when you're uh, in an opportunity to be a witness or to tell someone of the love of Christ, listen to the inner voice of God. Listen to what He's trying to tell you. And He will make a way to be able to speak into someone's life, change their circumstances, and help lead them to salvation. So it's nothing of ourselves. We just got to show people the door sometimes. So the, uh, the offshoot of this is, personally speaking, I find it incred incredible sometimes that God has actually called me. Now I know without a shadow of doubt He's called me, and I have no problem understanding that He's called people like Kenneth Copeland. I have no problem understanding that He's called people like Pastor James or any, any man of God that you can think of. 
But to think he's actually called you and you and you and you and whoever's watching by the internet. If you're a born again Christian, God has called you to be a witness. He's called you into ministry. We're not all going to be fivefold ministers and have a big platform and a major international ministry, but we have a ministry wherever we are at any given moment in any given opportunity. The Holy Spirit might call on us and say, hey, he really needs to know this. So, um, so like I said, I can understand God calling other people sometimes. I can even understand God calling you. You're very sweet. You're wonderful and outgoing, and you all automatically right up the room as soon as you walk in. I can understand God calling someone like you, but personally, when you look at yourselves, you know your flaws. You know where you came from. You know all the issues and things you're struggling with, the good things that God's still dealing with, and, but God's called you. He's chosen you. You right now are righteous before God as if you've never sinned. He sees none of that. We think about it because we've got that old nature. So, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 3, verse 1. If you can throw that up there real quick. I apologize. I said I wasn't going to put those up there. I'm going to read through these real quick. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. We're just going to stop there real quick, and we're going to jump through. But um, we all know who Paul is. We all know where he came from. The Bible records the things he did, how he was a scholar of scholars, a Pharisee of Pharisees, and he was zealous for God for the former religion. He was zealous for uh, fighting the, uh, the Christian faith that was rising up. He was zealous, but in the wrong way. And so we all know Paul and where he came from. But here's Paul saying he's the prisoner of Christ. He's literally captivated by Christ, and he has a calling now. And this is him that's been writing this letter to us, to the Church of Ephesians, and to us today. We know where Paul came from. We know everything he did wrong, but we also know everything he did right. The moment he had an opportunity to change his life, to turn things around, he seized it, he took it, and he repented, and he went on with God. So I'm not going to jump into too much. You don't have to go to the rest of these scriptures. I'm just going to read them real quick. If you have heard the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you, word. And verse 3. How that by the revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote to you a few words before. Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So Paul's saying, I've got a lot to tell you, and we're about to show you here in just a few seconds. That in the ages to come sorry, in, in other ages, was not made known to the sons of men, but is now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And the revelation was this, Ephesians 3, 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. We talked before about how there's no longer a Jew or, or a Gentile or uh, rich nor poor, but we're all one body now. So Paul is saying here, the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. This was a new revelation. The, uh, the Jewish people can understand the Messiah was coming for them. They understood the Messiah was coming um, to bring salvation to the world, but they, they failed to realize and failed to recognize for the longest time that it was also available to the Gentiles now. We all know the story about how um, Peter was up on the rooftop and God gave him a vision, and then he said, I'm going to send you over to a household, and he showed him a vision of unclean animals, and Peter says, these are unclean, and God says, if I call something clean, it's clean. And Peter said, okay, God sent him to a Gentile's house, ministered salvation, they got saved. But Peter still struggled with that revelation later on when it talks about later on how he was actually trying to get the Gentiles to become the Jews. He was trying to talk to them about circumcision. He was talking about keeping the Passover. He's talking to them all these legal things the Jewish nation used to do. But Paul had to step in, and that's what one of these letters is actually talking about. Paul had to step in and basically say, we're one body now. We're, we're, we're no different, and we're one body. So, Ephesians 3, 7. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, which is given to me the effectual working of His power. Unto me, who am I, less than all the saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. We're nearly there. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, the, from the beginning, the, the word that had been hid in God, who created all things in Christ Jesus, so we're finally to today's lesson. So that was just to catch us up. Okay, um, Ephesians 3.10. We can jump there real quick. So all that saying to jump into the, the, 
the depth of what is in chapter 3 here, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. The Amplified Bible says, uh, this, purpose, this is the purpose that through the church the complicated and many-sided wisdom of God and all its infinite variety and innumerable aspects might now be made known to the angelic rulers and authorities, the principalities and powers in the heavenly sphere. Um, you have to realize that all these things that Paul is talking about were, were hidden before. The, the enemy didn't even know them. And Satan's a, a, a cunning serpent. The, uh, he has a, a craft and a knowledge of how to twist things around, but even he didn't realize uh, what God was planning through Christ. We've heard it said many times that had Satan known that Jesus was actually meant to die, he would have never had him crucified. But God hid all these things. He hid it even from the Jewish people. He had to train them up that when the Messiah came, that they would go through the same process that they've always done with the sacrificial offerings, the, the spotless lamb, and sacrifice it unto the Lord. And that's what they uh, did to the Messiah. They did it unknowingly. They were literally trained how to do it so that when he showed up, the sacrifice would be made. So, the word known there means to certify, declare, make known, to give to understand. And it's the same thing we're doing today. In spreading the gospel in any given opportunity, in any situation, you have to help other people know about Jesus. You have to help them uh, come to the saving knowledge that Christ has actually come, died for them, and made a way for them to get to heaven. And the word church there. Um, it's the same word we always use, ecclesia, but it also means a popular meeting, uh, a congregation, a community of members on earth or saints in heaven, or both, an assembly. And just, just real quick on a side note, how many people have you ran into before and they're, they're not going to church anywhere and they say, oh, we are the church, I don't have to go to a building. Well, if one individual is the church, that's great, that's fantastic, technically it is true, but it also, that same word, ecclesia, means an assembly. And how many of you realize you can't be an assembly all into yourself? We talked before about how um, we are being builded by God. We're literally bricks in a wall. Jesus is the chief cornerstone, and God is building something. And a brick by, all by itself, a brick off in a parking lot, has no purpose. The wall is going to fall down. It needs that structure. You have a part to play. So... Uh, you can't be a, a congregation on, all unto yourself. Now, you can have an audience with God at any given moment. You are part of the church, but we also need to be fitly joined together. So, manifold, that word there means um, variegated, multifarious. It basically means it's uh, many faceted aspects of that. So, many and varied, uh, continually, reveal, continually revealed, and wisdom, we've looked at that word before, um, it means worldly or spiritual wisdom. But uh, let's look at the God, plan of God for a second. Uh, it was not God's intention for um, just to fight our fight for us, so to speak, once we get saved, to fight our fight for us and hand Adam back his position. Now, God in the garden gave Adam and Eve a promise that come a certain day, uh, the seed of the woman was going to crush the head of the serpent. And this was a, a promise. This was the very first messianic promise that was given to mankind. But it wasn't that simple that God was just going to hand everything right back over to Adam all over again without any more knowledge, any more information being given to him. Now, Adam was given the knowledge of good and evil when he ate that tree. But on top of that, he also needs to now have access to God's wisdom. Because we have this burden, we have this situation to deal with this sin and this information, this knowledge of good and evil, and the only way we can properly deal with it and not be two-faced uh, two and uh, two-sided is the only way to properly deal with it, we have to have access to God's wisdom, to God's grace to work it out, and God's uh, plan and purpose for our life so that we don't fall right back in the same situation and end up in sin again. So, uh, we got bullied in a sense in the garden. Just like in the schoolyard sense, we got picked on, we fell, we messed up. It was our fault and it was the enemy's fault. And God has been busy teaching us ever since then and helping us get back in the right shape spiritually and condition us to be able to get back at the devil. We do that in Jesus' name, not in our own name. And 
through this ability that he's now given us, we now have authority, and my, my words there is to, to kick his backside. We have authority through Jesus Christ to be able to keep the enemy down out of our own lives, out of the lives of our loved ones, out of our family members. We have authority through the name of Jesus. So how humiliating to the devil, we have Jesus' name, the ability to undo all the work against us uh, and anything that comes against you. We have the ability, anything, the Bible actually says that uh, we have the ability to call the, the enemy to be trapped in his own trap, snared in his own snare. He'd fall in his own pit. And, it, and it's literally like a, a, a 1950s cartoon where you see the enemy and he's sitting there going, and I've got that idea, I've got crafts, and then he's going to fall right into it like Coyote and Roadrunner. And the enemy is the coyote, and we're the roadrunner. We keep just going right on past his traps every single time through the grace of God and through the name of Jesus, and the enemy is sitting there and the rock falls on him, or the snare snares him, or it explodes up in his face. And we do that not in our own standing, but in the name of Jesus and through now knowing our right position in Christ. So this is why this was all a mystery. It was all kept hidden to keep secret, to keep it from getting out too early. Now, it's this time, the church age, the age of grace that we are now in, that a believer has more ability and authority than ever before. Mark 16, verse 17 and 18. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall... In, in, in whose name? Not our name. But in his name, in Jesus' name, shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. This is just a, a, a glimpse of what's actually available to us in the authority and the position that we now have through Christ Jesus. We have the ability to undo anything the enemy has ever planned for evil. We have the ability now to do things for good, to do things for God. So. When we're doing what we're supposed to do, these signs are going to follow us. It's not necessarily even that we're, we're doing them. The Bible says that some of the apostles, when they just walked by the sick and the shadow of them fell on the sick, the sick were getting healed. The signs are going to follow you. If you're a believer and you have your, your full knowledge and the full understanding of who you are in Christ, these signs are going to follow you. How many of you, I know, I know it was this way for me, but how many of you, when you first got saved and you're exuberant and you're, you're on fire for God, it seems like anything you asked of God, immediately it came to pass? Was it like that for any of you? I mean, I remember being stuck at a red light, and I'm sitting there going, God, I'm running late. Can you please change this to a green light? And it seemed like immediately the green light would change, and it didn't even seem like the traffic pattern even finished, but the, everyone stopped, and I had a green light. I had that thing for, for crossing the road, and when I'm walking down the street, I had it for when I needed money. And then all of a sudden, after a while, after I got a little bit more knowledge, after I got a, grew up a bit, it's like the training wheels kind of came off for me. I don't know if it was like that for any of you, but the training wheels came off, and all of a sudden I had to exercise some of this knowledge that I had and actually use some faith. And it's literally like when you're a new believer, God's showing you all these things are going to happen. All these things are possible. Okay, now that you know how to walk a little bit, go on. Take some steps, walk out there, and as you're going, these signs shall follow you. That's what you have to keep in mind. Um, there, there's a book by Oral Roberts, and it said, uh, uh, in, in one of the, uh, the pages there, it said, expect a miracle daily. And it's not that we're supposed to look for the supernatural, but we have to realize that the supernatural is looking for us. You have to realize that if you're a believer and you have the same authority of the living Christ who is walking on this earth and is now ever living to uh, make intercession for us in the right hand of God, He's in you, He's with you, and you have that same authority. The, the signs and wonders are going to follow you. So if, if someone's sick, lay hands and pray for them. You don't have to do anything else. You just have to do it in G Jesus' name, not, his, not of our own name. You do it in Jesus' name and realize that we have that authority, just like we used the example before about a policeman with a badge. He represents an entire police force. And if the entire police force isn't enough, he represents the authority that goes all the way up to the army. You know, if it gets out of hand and there's a riot in the streets and one police officer is the one that tries to stop it initially, if the police officers aren't enough, they bring in the SWAT team. If the SWAT team's not enough, they bring in the National Guard. If the National Guard's not enough, they'll bring in the army. 
we have a chain of authority that goes all the way back up to the throne of God. And if we're doing it for the right reasons, for godly reasons, we're going to have the same results, and those signs are going to follow us. Amen? Okay. Where am I at here? Uh, Ephesians 3.11. All that was for free. I just wanted to show you what's available to you. Ephesians 3.11. According to the eternal purpose which He has purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Amplified says, This is in accordance with the terms and the eternal and timeless purpose which He has realized and carried into effect in the person of Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm going to skip down to the definitions. You can read those in your own time if you like. I'm going to try to keep on schedule here today. Uh, Ephesians 3.12 In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. So we just talked about the authority. We just talked about the fact that signs and wonders are going to follow you. If you're in the uh, understanding that the supernatural is available to you, you know your position in Christ. So we now have boldness and access. What's that access for? Access to the throne of God. Access to the authority and the power of Christ Jesus. We have access, and it's with confidence by the faith of Him. Like I talked about before, when you're, you're a new believer and you're walking out and everything just seems to be golden for you. Everything's working, everything's great, and then all of a sudden you have to use a little exercise. You have to exercise a faith. You have to exercise some knowledge that you now have. But once you've done that one or two times, don't you realize it gets easier? Same way when we lift weights or uh, we exercise in the natural. I'm not one to talk, but anyway. Uh, when we exercise in the natural, you have to realize that the first time you lift the heavy object, it's going to be hard. And the next time you lift it, it's going to be even harder because your muscle's tired now. And then the next time you lift, but if you take a break and you come back to it later on, it's going to be easier. And if you keep doing that, then it'll be super easy. And you're like, I need, I need more weight. Now, as you ex exercise your faith, as you work out and walk out your salvation with God, we're going to get confident by the faith of Him. Um, I've just started this job again. Uh, I'm lifting furniture, and, and i got to tell you the truth. The first time I lifted one of those heavy boxes, it was really heavy. I thought I was going to pass out the first time. My blood was pumping and my face was red, but I managed to make it work. And then the next time I came to the same piece of furniture, it was just as tough. And then now a couple months on, I'm lifting some of those uh, boxes, and it's, it's like it's nothing at all. There's, there's something that I have a little bit more confidence that this thing that I've worked out, this thing that I've exercised, is now easier to do. And the more you walk out your salvation and your calling with God, your position in Him, you get confidence. So now when someone says, hey, can you lift that thing? You know, two months ago, it'd be like, um, uh, maybe, yeah, uh, can, you, can you give me a hand? I didn't really have confidence in my own body and my own ability to do certain things. Now since I've, I've worked it out and I've walked it out a few times, I know I've got a little bit more strength and a little bit more ability, and I can lift the heavy thing. And that's what it is when we were a new believer. The training wheels are on and everything's great. The training wheels come off and all of a sudden we have to exercise. But after we've gone through the battle a few times, after we've stomped in the head of the enemy a few times, we have confidence knowing it's going to work every time. Amen? Okay. So now we have boldness. That word boldness there means a frankness, bluntness. It also means publicity. It means assurance, confidence, and it also means to be freely, openly, and plainly. When uh, we as believers have this confidence in God, have this confidence in Christ, have this confidence on who He says you are, and you realizing you know what He said is true, then that boldness is going to be in you. You're going to have confidence in certain situations to lay hands on the sick and see the sick recover. You're going to have confidence in certain situations to pray over loved ones and situations and know they're going to change. You get a confidence. You get a boldness after that. And that word there, access, it means admission. We literally have free admission to the throne room of God from now on. As believers, we're part of His family. We're, we're not only part of His family, we're part of His uh, plan. As we talked about before, how we're being builded together. We're part of God's plan. We have access to Him, and we now have access to anything we have need of. Ephesians 3.13 Wherefore I desire that ye faint not 
at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Now, just a quick background. Paul is in, at this particular uh, situation, he is in bondage. He is in chains when he's writing this letter, and he's been bound up for a while now, but the church is now hearing of his situation. And Paul is the one that's already talked about everything we've got, uh, gone through up till now so that we know our position and the plan of God and where we are in God. But at this point, Paul's actually saying, don't worry about me. I'm more worried about you. Paul is, has still an opportunity to preach the gospel through writing letters. The, the uh, biblical historians and external and internal historians actually said that uh, Paul was actually preaching the gospel to his captors, to the very men that were uh, keeping him in chains and some of the same men that had to beat him daily when he was in prison. But he was still preaching to them, and many of them got saved. But Paul's saying, don't worry about me. I'm, I, I'm, I'm going through all of this for your glory. Paul said in many times that he wished that at certain points that he could actually go on to heaven. He says, that would be my gain if I go on to heaven. But if I stay, it's for your benefit. There's things that you need to know, things you need to hear. And when we go through our situations, realize we go through them. Paul still used the same opportunity as a platform that the enemy meant for evil. He used it as a platform to preach the gospel, not only to the, those that are around him, but to the churches that receive the letters. The same thing happens today. Many times men go into prison, and some of them think my life is over. I've met many of them that have been in prison. And they think my life is over, I've messed up, I can't get out of this. But in prison, there's still an opportunity to get a Bible. In prison, there's still an opportunity to have a, a man or woman of God come in and teach you and hear the Word of God. And you have to realize that if you use that opportunity, and it's the same thing I talked to people when I was in uh, prison ministry and I talked talk to them, use this opportunity, you got some free time. It doesn't seem like it. Consider this a, a hard-earned vacation to get your life right. Take that Bible, get that Word into you, and actually work on changing yourself. Let God work through you and change your life and situation. And so many of them took that opportunity. I, I've met several of them that have actually been out of prison that uh, I ran into since I actually came back from uh, Ireland. And they're surprised I'm still flowing and going, and I'm surprised they're still flowing and going. Many of them are actually in church. So, um, so wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for, for you, which is for your glory. Um, Ephesians 3.13 in the Amplified says, so I ask you not to lose heart, not to faint, or become despondent through fear, at which I am suffering on your behalf. Rather, glory in it, for it is, it is an honor to you. So Paul's in prison. He's telling the ones uh, that he's writing to, preaching to, some amazing revelation. And don't think about it for one moment of the situation he's going through, because God is in the circumstance getting all the glory and honor even now. So Ephesians 3, 14. For this cause, I bow my knees to, unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul just said, uh, because of this tribulation and situation, and you're getting the, the, the benefit out of it because I'm able to teach you and, and reach out to you. So for this cause, he bows his knees to the Father and the Lord of Jesus Christ. Um, the Amplified says, for this reason, seeing the greatness of this plan by which you are built together in Christ, I bow my knees, he gives thanks, before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, no major notes about the, the words here, but uh, Paul was in the situation he was in for one reason or another because he wouldn't stop preaching the gospel. Um, there's a few teachings about this. Paul was actually forewarned not to go to Jerusalem. He was forewarned not to do certain things, but he did it anyway. He thought it would be better that he goes ahead and, and teaches the gospel in certain areas that he was actually warned by God not to. So, uh, some teach that uh, this was Paul actually uh, being told by God this is going to happen, and some teach that it's going to be uh, going to happen if you go there. So, Paul actually, seemingly, in my opinion, had a choice either to go to Jerusalem and end up in prison or not to go to Jerusalem and go ahead and teach and preach elsewhere. But he chose to go ahead and go to where his heart was at the time. He was a at one time, a scribe of scribes, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a scholar of scholars, and he was one of those people. And he and himself decided, I'm going to go back and make sure they hear the word. They may not receive it, but even if this costs me my freedom, I'm going to go back and teach the gospel. So, 
uh, if pastor teaches something different on that, then listen to him, not me. Uh, Ephesians 3.15. So talking about Christ Jesus. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The Amplified says, For whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that the Father of whom all fatherhood takes its title and derives its name. Everything that's in heaven, everything that's in earth that is called according to God is named according to Jesus Christ because we're brought together through Him. We're one family through Him. The word family, um, it means paternal descent. Concretely, a group of families or a whole race, a nation, a family, a kindred, or a lineage. And the name there, of course, means name. But all that to say that you are now God's family. So my last name is Dispensa. But eternally, I'm also the family of Christ. The name of Jesus is written with my name. Eternally. Same with you. That you are now one family with me, with everyone else that's uh, in the body of Christ, because of Christ, because of Jesus. So, Ephesians 3.16 So that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the might by his spirit in the inner man. Pastor's teaching on the inner man right now. It's a great series. If you haven't got a CD yet, you need to get it. The Amplified says, May he grant you out of the rich treasury of his glory to be strengthened and reinforced with a mighty power in the inner man by the Holy Spirit himself and dwelling in your innermost being and personality. Now we talked about before since the and dwelling the Holy Spirit has actually occurred in our life, and many of us speak in tongues, and we have access now to the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God, and the, the unction of the Holy Spirit, the inner leading of the Holy Spirit. We as fleshly beings who still get it wrong need to learn how to exercise, just like we talked about, have confidence in Him, and learn to listen for the voice of God when He leads us and guides us. And it's something we should be doing daily, not just daily, but also moment to moment. Listen for the still small voice of the Holy Spirit leading and guiding you in any given situation. So, the word strengthen, we looked at before, but it's the word kratos, and it means ruling power. God wants you to have ruling power over your flesh and over your inner man. So, He's given us that authority. So, the Bible says that uh, this day I've uh, set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, and then He gives you a hint even. He says, choose life. So when we're in any given situation, we have the ruling authority over our own flesh, over our inner man, to choose what God has asked us to do, to choose the good things, the better things in any situation. So we also rule with might. The word there is dunamis, which is where we get the word dynamite from. And it means inherent power. And this is in reference to your faith, that you have to learn how to exercise, you have to learn how to use, because for most of us, the training wheels have been off for a long time, but we have to be confident in what God has given us and set before us that we have the ability to exercise and strengthen ourselves and grow. So when you use the faith that God has given you, you become stabilized in life. Many believers, when they, they uh, first come to Christ, some situation usually occurs and all of a sudden you kind of see them bouncing in a church and bouncing out of church and bouncing in a church and bouncing out of church. And when you come to the knowledge of, of God, when you come to salvation knowledge and you have that relationship with Him, you have to realize that at certain points, uh, when you trust Him and seek after Him, your life, your situation, and things around you are going to become more and more and more stable, and then you're not going to feel like the world's out to get you all the time. You're going to feel like you have that confidence and power to walk through the situations, know what God wants you to do, and walk it out. So circumstances will no longer dictate to you. You have the ability to dictate to them. How many of us know the, the verse that uh, Jesus said about how you can speak to these mountains, call these things that be not as though they were? We can uh, say to this fig tree to dry up and it'll dry up. We can speak to circumstances now. Uh, many times I've been in, in Ireland in uh, tough situations, either financially or uh, socially or any kind of given situation, and it didn't look good. It looked bleak. And all of a sudden, I just decided to rise up in myself, kind of wake up and say, hey, you know what? I have authority. I have the ability to speak to the situation. And so I just spoke to the situation, in Jesus' name, you change. This needs to happen and not that, in Jesus' name, and then dismiss it. And the same thing happened. I know a, a brother in Christ who 
uh, had a court case. And for whatever situation, it was something to do with taxes or something like that. And he had a court case, and if it didn't go in his favor, he was going to end up in prison. He was going to end up in jail. And he says, uh, I may or may not be guilty. I, I didn't do things the right way, honestly. I know that's for a fact, but I didn't do it intentionally. It was kind of a, a mistake. And, but I don't really want to go to prison. I've got a family to support. I've got this going on. And I think it was in the prayer lines or something like that when uh, I heard about the, that he had this situation. And so I told him, I said, you know that you can speak to that mountain. So I'm going to get in agreement with you. Your words are going to be uh, praying. I'm not going to pray, but I'm going to get in agreement with you. I want your words out of your mouth to speak to this mountain. And so I said, you need to uh, speak over the situation and speak what you want to happen. Be specific. And so this brother got on the phone with me, and he, he's praying. He says, I want the, the court case to go into my favor. Even though I might be guilty, I want the judge to rule in my favor so it won't be binding me up in any bad situation so that I'll be free from the circumstances and these things will change. And he says, in Jesus' name, amen. I said, I'm in agreement with you, brother. Amen. And then a few months later, I get a phone call back on the, the prayer lines, and sure enough, it's that same brother, and he gave a prayer, prayer report or a praise report that the situation went exactly. The judge threw it out, says you do need to pay it out, but you've got your lifetime to pay it out. Go ahead and just pay a little bit at a time, whatever it takes, but we're not going to throw you in prison over this. We can speak to these circumstances and situations that cause them to change. So, through Christ, keeping that in mind, through Christ, you become the master over the things in life, and you will begin to truly reign as an ambassador and citizen of the kingdom of God. So, I may have to stop here, but I'm going to go ahead and preface with this. How many of you realize that the ambassador for America to certain countries, they don't live in a shack? How many of you realize that when he needs to go someplace, he always has a vehicle? When he needs money or in any certain situation, they, they've already provided him a, a spending allowance. When an ambassador of a situation in a, or of a country and any given circumstance in any situation has access to things that are even in his personal finance, if he needs for uh, the sake of his country or situation, he can tap onto an authority and a, um, uh, a power that's greater than himself. So, for example, the ambassador to America has access to the, the, the budget that's been allowed to all embassies in America. He has access to the uh, United States government's budget itself if he, if he needs it. And if a situation goes wrong and he needs authority and power to correct that situation, he has access to call up the president, tell what's going on, and call in the army if he needs to. Now, I say all that to say this. We are ambassadors for Christ, and we're supposed to live in these circumstances and situations in victory. We're supposed to uh, face these problems. We're supposed to have uh, this exercise that we're used to now, used to walking these things out. And so when circumstances and situations come our way, when you know who you are in Christ and you realize that you're in His family, you have access to Him, just like we talked about. We have access to His wisdom and knowledge in the inner man that you are supposed to work out and walk out your salvation and we're supposed to live as ambassadors for His kingdom. We're supposed to realize that we can have everything we need, all our needs met, and it's not just talking about the flesh, but also about the spirit man, and also about our, our health, our finances, and any situation, any circumstance, you have to realize you have access to something that is far greater than yourself because we're now in Him. Amen? So, I'll end on this last verse. Ephesians 3.17 That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love, and of course that goes on but we're going to stop here, uh, that word there is agape. When we have the God kind of love love is, is the foundation of our lives because faith is useless without love. Uh, Galatians 5.6 Sorry, I said that was going to be the last one. One more. Did I not have that one down? I'm sorry. Galatians 5, 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So, um, Many ministers and men and women of God, when a certain window doctrine actually came through the body of Christ at, at one point in time, um, they started thinking that uh, the ability and the anointing was all them. They started thinking that um, it was themselves 
and they weren't even giving God the glory anymore. But we have to realize that uh, when we walk these things out, when we walk in love and we walk in our, our um, power and authority we have in Christ, we do it by love. The disciples themselves even said about certain cir uh, circumstances and situations that when something didn't go their way, they said, Jesus, let us call down fire and let it consume them, just like the Old Testament. And Jesus rebuked them and he says, you don't know who you're of. We're supposed to be walking in love. We're supposed to be working in love. So we do things when we're preaching from the pulpit or when we're walking out our uh, situation, the circumstances with our family, with our coworkers, with our loved ones, with our neighbors. Remember to walk in love and you can have boldness and confidence in Christ that anything that you ask for, you'll get. Anything that you need, it'll get provided. And we just walk this out with love and, and understanding the circumstances. We have the authority through Christ to be able to walk this out and live like ambassadors for Christ. Amen? Amen. Thank you very much.